Hello viewers, welcome back to my channel. My name is Tawia Matope. I'm a social worker by profession and currently a team manager in one of the local authorities. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a few nuggets or tips of how to work with uh, no recourse to public funds families uh, when you are working as a social worker in a local authority. Um, so I just want to put a disclaimer to say I'm not I don't claim to be a guru when it comes to child protection and safeguarding, but these are uh, these nuggets which I share on my channel is things that I've accumulated over the years of practicing and working with children and families, and also from my own research. So I'm hoping that it will help one or two people, or even the families who are being engaged by social care or by social workers. Right. Well, so when you talk of of no. Uh, no recourse to public funds, families, or what we call NRPF uh, families, or no recourse to public funds. In some local authorities, they, they abbreviate as NRTPF. Uh, so no recourse to public funds, families, um, uh, those families who have no recourse to public funds in um, when they migrate to come to live or work in England, uh, or in, in, in Wales, or I would say in the UK in general. And um, one thing to be mindful is that such families do present some unique challenges um, when it comes to children safeguarding work um, in England. Uh, they are typically those families who are subject to immigration controls and they do not have access to certain public funds, including child benefits, things that we take for granted for those who have got access to public funds. Families who are coming to you know, live in the UK for the first time may not have uh, access to public funds for the first five years up until they obtain their indefinite leave to remain. Or if they are you know, coming as refugees, they may not necessarily have uh, access to public funds, uh, but they may have access to public funds under the Refugee uh, Policy or the Refugee Act and so forth. Right, so such public funds that we can talk about would be, for example, child benefits, tax uh, credits, uh, you can talk of the most welfare benefits that you can think of, including housing benefit or free health care. Sometimes they may not have access to that. Uh, they have to pay what we call sometimes immigration health surcharge fee for them to be able to access the GP or for them to be able to access the health um, facilities. So these families, uh, they face uh, significant financial hardships, mostly around um, not being able to access public funds or trying to make ends meet when it comes to provision of, you know, the most basic things that you can think of uh, for the family. So sometimes the responsibility falls on the local authorities, not sometimes, but all the times that the responsibility falls on the local authorities uh, in such situations where, you know, if families have no recourse to public funds and they find themselves in a situation where they may need assistance, the local authority has got the mandate to support them. Right. Um, so some of the, you know, difficulties that or some of the significant challenges that they may face would be issues around financial hardships. Sometimes, especially if they lose their job uh, or one of the parents loses their job or sometimes they might even face social isolation in the communities where they are living and uh, they might be more vulnerable to exploitation or sometimes to even abuse including racial abuse as well. Uh, so here are some of the tips on how best, you know, uh, social workers can work with no recourse to public fund families uh, when it comes to children safeguarding work. Um, one and foremost, the most important thing is you need to understand the legal framework underpinning working with no recourse to public fund families. Um, chief among those would be obviously the Children's Act. The Children's Act applies to all the children in England or Wales. It doesn't matter. We have got you no, know, you've got recourse to public funds, or you do not have recourse to public funds. When it comes to safeguarding, you know, we do implement the law according, you know, as expected, despite whether you've got recourse to public funds or you don't have. So, you need to understand the legal framework underpinning um, working with no recourse to public fund families. Um, you must, you must also have an understanding of the Human Rights Act because remember, there is a human rights assessment that needs to be completed whenever you're working with the uh, no recourse to public fund uh, families. Um, each and every local authority, in most local authorities, they've got a policy of how one can po properly engage with uh, no recourse to public funds. F make sure that you familiarize yourself with this policy as you'll be working with uh, such families to make sure that when you go out there and when you get allocated to you know to such a family, you know exactly uh, what that local authority you know stipulates when it comes to, for example, the allowances which they are 
eligible to get per week for because it differs from one local authority to the other obviously a local authority which is in london which is quite expensive might not necessarily be the same amount uh that you know families with no recourse to public funds might get uh for a local authority which is in yorkshire or um basically which is where, where you know it's not that much expensive uh so to speak um right you, you should also you know in in terms in terms of knowing the legal framework or the police framework underpinning uh you know working with no recourse to public funds it will also help you to identify the legal options which are available to these families um yeah and um it it will also help you to know how best you can support them and it's also good for you to know the support agencies which are available in your local um area where you could actually refer them for support services for example uh you should know where the migrant center is or red cross or any other charities that do support migrant families to be able to uh you know to to be able to apply to the home office or for for uh, to apply for exemption of the home office fees that needs to be paid things like that and then point number two you as a social worker or as a professional family support worker who is working with families with no recourse to public funds you should be able to build trust and rapport this is really 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 important um right so the reason why i'm mentioning this is because no recourse to public fund families mostly are hesitant to engage with professionals due to fear of deportation especially if they know that that things are not in order or you know the consequences of them being in the country illegally sometimes you know just holds them back in terms of accessing support uh, so you should be able to build trust and rapport with families and assure them that you are there to support them rather than you know possibly there to 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 to, to persecute them or whatever they might be having in their mind uh, so it's important for you to be able to build rapport and trust with these families and it is critical, you know, to make sure that you overcome, you know, the barriers that could be there in terms of them accessing support, really. Um, so as a social worker or as a family support worker working with them or any other professional, a teacher or a health care professional, you need to be open and honest with them about what your role is, what you can and cannot do. If there is need for you to be liaising with the home office, be clear on why you'll be doing that and what it is. Or what is the reason why you'll be doing that as well? Yeah. So take time to explain the processes and the options available to them. And um, point number three, the other most important thing which I've identified here is to make sure that you use an interpreter. As you know, or obviously, most no recourse to public fund families may not know originally be from this country by virtue of you know um, possibly them being immigrants. Um, so sometimes there might be language barriers. So you need to make sure that whenever you're engaging with them for avoidance of any doubt and, and also to make sure that you are delivering a good service to them and to make sure that uh, they do understand, you know, your intervention and they do understand what it is that you want to achieve with them, make use of an interpreter. So with interpreters, there are many agencies that do offer interpreting services. Some of them can be in person. Some of them can be through the phone. When you visit them, you'll be able to dial them in and you'll be able, you'll be able to have that conversation with them. So obviously, if English is not their first language, make sure that you make use of an interpreter. And um, this interpreter, you need to make sure that he or she is one that is able to convey your message and to them and also to convey the family's message views and needs to you and so that you'll be able to work on them and you'll be able to support them accordingly um you know making use of an interpreter to them i think it will also help you in terms of building that trust and building that rapport that we, that i spoke about earlier on and to ensure that the family fully understands the process and the support um which is available to them you know from you and the agents that you're working with or you know the local authority that you're working with um right point number um, point number four you need to be aware of the cultural differences that you might be having um as opposed to the family that you're working with um you know obviously uh families with no recourse to public funds they do come from a different cultural background than yours in most cases there are some instances where you might work with a family with no recourse to public fund and you possibly come from the same country. Or, for example, I'm originally from Zimbabwe. They might be coming originally from Zimbabwe and you might be allocated to them that 
actually helps it because you might you know know some of the cultural uh you know issues that might come into play and how you can address those ones uh but it's good for you to research about the family that you're working with uh if you don't know anything about their culture or you know there's nothing for you there's nothing wrong with you as well coming out to them and say you know i know nothing about your culture can you talk to me about how things are done in your culture when it comes to a specific issue and then you'll be able to have an understanding of uh, you know the dynamics within that family um so you know uh, sometimes they might have a, for example a different view when it comes to child rearing uh, depending with how gender roles are assigned in their own particular culture for example in some cultures including possibly my own culture when i grew up i knew obviously automatic that my mom is there to be taking care of us dad is there to be bringing in the bacon for example but in some cultures you know the roles can be interchangeably um, visible. So, um, you know, their views around child rearing as well as uh, parenting might be different, including discipline techniques might be different. So it's about knowing those and how best you can support them to make sure that they adapt to the local expectations as well. Uh, be aware of these differences and work collaboratively with the family to find cultural appropriate solutions, you know, to any challenges that they might be facing. Right, and then point number, um, the next point is you need to be very flexible when it comes to working with no recourse to public fund uh, families. Remember, these are families that might be coming um, from a different country where, you know, things are not done the same as they are being done, you know, in England. Um, so you need to be very, very flexible and their needs might change from day one where you have known them uh today too when you go back and see them again uh because by virtue of not having recourse to public funds they face unique challenges that in other families may not necessarily face um so when it comes to issues like for example domestic abuse it might be it might not necessarily be easy to to pick those because remember they will be usually co-dependence on each other in terms of finances, in terms of, you know, everything. So sometimes they might be, they might feel restricted to be reporting issues around domestic abuse. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about you, you know, making use of inventive ways of trying to uh, gather that information and be able to assess and support them accordingly. Um, right. So you need to be flexible in your approach and work with the family to identify alternative sources of support. It doesn't necessarily mean that the support that you're going to be delivering to them comes from the local authority budget alone. I always encourage uh, social workers in my team to make sure that before we make use of the budget of the local authority, are there any other partner agencies who can support with exactly what the family is looking for? What is school able to provide? What is the health visitor able to provide? Um, what is What are the charities around able to provide? You might be surprised to know that some charities do provide beds, cot beds, things, you know, white goods, stuff like that. So it's not all their needs that will be, you know, that you might end up using the budget of the local authority. But you might be able to uh, rely on partner agencies and, you know, charities, are the local charities to actually make sure that these families are well supported. Yeah. So this brings me to the next point uh, which i wrote down here in my little research where i spoke about collaboration with partner agencies this is very very important multi agents working has been emphasized you know in the previous video which i posted earlier on uh, which talks about um, you know working together uh, to safeguard children the document of 2018 emphasizes the importance of collaborating with partner agencies to make sure that you deliver a holistic um you know a holistic service to these families so um obviously when you're working with no recourse to public funds families it requires you sometimes to link up with the home office to link up with the migrant center uh to link up with um possibly their employers to link up with uh the nurseries to link up with the schools to link up with the hospitals you know many other agencies that you may need to be linking up with uh, or collaborate with to make sure that um uh, their needs are, are met or their needs, you know, are addressed. Um, so you need to collaborate with these agencies to ensure that the family receives the support that is commensurate to them or the support that they need. And um, moving on to the next point, you need to make sure that you keep the child's best interest at the forefront. 
you need to keep the child's best interest at the forefront. One thing I've noticed when it comes to engaging with no recourse public funds families is when one assessment is done and it rules out, you know, uh, the, the, the presence of any safeguarding concerns, whoever is going to be going into that, fam into that family, usually they will just base their assessment or they'll just base their observations on the assessment which was done by previously by somebody else. You need to keep a close eye on the child's best interest. Some of the concerns do develop while you're already working with this family. So if there are, if you feel that there are any safeguarding concerns that you may need, that or even things that you are doubting, bring them to the attention of your manager. If a conversation with your manager to determine whether the threshold has been met for you to do something about it or for you to actually escalate that case maybe to a strategy meeting or something like that. So you need to make sure that you keep the child's best interest at the forefront of what is happening. Right. So with regards to families uh, with no recourse to public funds, it's possible that they might be having financial challenges or financial hardships, right? But if support has been put in place, but you still notice that children are possibly going to school hungry or uh, their uniforms are not being washed or clothes, they are wearing dirty clothes or stuff like that. When you know that you've supported them you know, fully to meet the needs of the children, then there might be question marks around neglect with regards to that family, isn't it? So you need to make sure that you cover all those angles and you need to make sure that the child's best interests are of paramount importance when you are engaging with these families. Um, so they, 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 there's no difference when working with no recourse to public fund families or other families that you are working with when it comes to safeguarding. Safeguarding work is safeguarding whether it's no recourse to public funds families or families with recourse to public funds. So you need to ensure that the child's welfare is the primary consideration in all the decisions that you make when it comes to working with children, with, uh, uh, with, with children or families of no recourse to public funds. Uh, with all with those few nuggets, I think um, some of you might find them quite helpful when it comes to working with uh, families with no recourse to public funds. And the other thing that you need to ensure as well is to make sure that when uh, an assessment is done and allowances are determined as to what they need to be receiving every week, make sure that those payments are done regularly and on time to avoid any distress for these families, isn't it? And to make sure that, you know, the accommodation that they are in is actually meeting their needs as well. And if it is possible uh, to pay them with the host family, there are host families out there who are ready to take in migrant families, make sure that you pay them with host families and, um, you know, just to try to make sure that their lives are more comfortable, refer them to the play centers, refer them to uh, other support agencies where they can get support, you know, to make sure that they don't feel isolated in the communities that they are living in. It's easy, it will be easier for them to quickly integrate if they are linked up to other available support services in your local area, right? With those few words, I hope uh, this video has helped somebody, uh, whether you're a student or a social worker uh, or somebody who is just keen to know how, you know, social workers do work, how they work, we work with the uh, families with no recourse to public funds. Thank you so much.